Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. It's Laszlo Montgomery here with another edition of the China History Podcast. Yes, the same program recommended recently on the one and only Seneca Podcast by none other than the famous Kaiser Guo. Thanks, Kaiser. Still no intro music like they have on Seneca. I inquired about a license for about eight seconds of Can't Buy Me Love, you know, to kick off each CHP episode, but... Quarter million bucks, one-time usage fee was a little steep. So just imagine that song as the CHP intro music for this time. Patreon.com, if more of you sign up, I just may be able to license a few Beatles songs for the CHP. Go to Patreon.com slash China History Podcast. Join the elite gang of CHP patrons, many of whom even went and got second jobs just to support the show. Warlord Era Part 4 this time, 1917, 1918, 1919. Such tumultuous times in the fledgling Republic of China. Man, they were making the Qing Dynasty look good. We left off last time in the aftermath of the failed attempt by the pigtail general, Zhang Xun, at restoring the Qing Emperor onto the Dragon Throne. In the wake of this shakeup, Duan Qi Rei, was made premier and chief decider in the government. And the warlord from Zhili province, Feng Guozhang, he became the new president, succeeding Li Yuanhong, who was far from his power base in the middle Yangtze down south. He couldn't stand up to these generals any more than you or I could. So, August 1917, two warlords in charge of the government, for four months anyway, And from that point forward, it will be a revolving door in the offices of president, vice president, and premier. Down in the south of China, Dr. Sun Yat-sen set up a rival government based in Guangzhou. They were trying to be a player on the world stage, but the foreign powers and big financial institutions all know who buttered their bread in China. And they continued to recognize the northern government based in Beijing for now. And like I said... You had Duan and Feng in charge. Duan Qi Rei represented the interests of the Wan Xi, the Anhui clique, and Feng was the head of the Zhili clique, the Zhi Xi. Wan, of course, for anyone who has ever seen an Anhui province license plate, knows this is the one character abbreviation of Anhui province and all things Anhui. Wan was one of those many small statelets that no one remembers from the Eastern Zhou times more than 2,500 years ago. A Xi was the Chinese term for a clique or faction. In all the history books, these top warlord groups were referred to as cliques, which to me, going back to high school, sort of always had a slightly negative connotation to it. Now, down in Guangzhou, Sun Yat-sen and his followers didn't just lay down and die. They may not have had the international recognition they hoped for, but they still had their own powerful military backers. From 1917 to 1922, there was this warring period known as the Movement to Protect the Constitution, the Hu Fa Yun Dong. The Constitution being fought over was the provisional one that Yuan Shikai had torn up in May 1914. Sun Yat-sen was leading the charge to restore that constitution written at the founding of the new nation. It was a civil war with on-again, off-again battles. This movement to protect the constitution also goes by another name. The KMT called it their third revolution. This war marks the start of Hundreds of battles that would follow, big and small, of this warlord era. From the outset, it was quite a mismatch. So down in the south, with a hundred former members of the National Assembly who opted to support the KMT rather than the northern warlords, they assembled and called for a military government to be established based in Guangzhou, and Sun Yat-sen was made the Generalissimo, or Grand Marshal, the Da Yuan Shuai. Hey, baby, that's a higher rank than field marshal and a five-star general. So, September 1st, 1917, this parliament down in Guangzhou, they created this military government with the express intention of uniting the Chinese nation, 
challenging the Beiyang generals and making them tow the constitutional line. Easier said than done, as you'll see. I thought for this episode, let's take a short break from all the headliners up in Beijing I've been mentioning and begin with the province of Hubei. If you're not familiar with Chinese geography, there are two neighboring provinces, Hubei to the north and Hunan to the south. This area, geographically, is as core central China as you can get. And not being on the coast and all, they don't get the attention that the coastal provinces have always enjoyed in popular modern Chinese history. And as we go along, you will see these two provinces were also quite central to the warlord era in China, Hubei, Hunan. They sort of played a geographic and strategic role as the buffer provinces separating the northern and southern governments of China. If you controlled Hunan, well, Guangdong province was right next door, and that was your convenient gateway to Guangzhou, where the KMT government was based. But let's step away from all these big names I've mentioned these past episodes and turn our attention to central China. In doing so, I hope I can show you, in a microcosm, how things devolved so quickly and naturally into warlordism in China. The warlord down in Hubei was named Wang Zhanyuan. I'm guessing most of you never heard of him. Unlike most warlords, he wasn't from the province where he made his mark in history. He came from a very poor background in rural Shandong. During the 1880s, he got his start fighting as a soldier in Li Hongzhang's Huai Army. You remember that from part one. They helped bring down the Taipings. Wang Zhanyuan's big break came when he was admitted to the Tianjin Military Academy. Here he was able to shine and caught the attention of who else but Yuan Shikai. And he was able to parlay this relationship with Yuan into a position in Yuan's new army that later became the Beiyang Army. During the Second Revolution, when the Southern government attempted to organize a challenge to Yuan's authoritarianism, Wang Zhan Yuan, in what could later be said to have been a wise career move, stuck by Yuan Shikai and assisted in putting this uprising down quickly. Now, following a period of political maneuvering, involving disparate interests in Hunan and Hubei, Yuan was able to install Wang Zhanyuan as his guy down in Hubei province. This was in January of the fateful year of 1916. Well, fateful for Yuan Shikai, that is. This was the period when Yuan was making his grab for the emperorship, and he had placed all these loyal generals and all the governorships of all the provinces loyal to the Beiyang clique. And he was counting on their support as soon as he became the Hongxian emperor. However, following Yuan's bid to become emperor and his March 1916 abdication, not to mention the extreme diminishment in his prestige and political support, it was only a matter of time before his subordinates and their grand ambitions and ungovernable greed led them to turn their backs on their one-time benefactor. But as we know, Yuan Shikai conveniently died in June 1916, and that was the primary accelerant that led to the warlord period. And what followed was a tragic parade lasting from 1916 to 1928 that saw 26 prime ministers, nine different presidents, a dysfunctional and hopelessly corrupt parliament, and now these regional strongmen who took advantage of the times to withhold tax revenue, farm their provinces for treasure, obtain loans from foreign lenders, and just line their pockets. And they thumb their noses at any laws enacted by the central government in Beijing. And there was no central army controlled by the ROC government who could take these warlords on. And worst of all, in the provinces where they ruled, they sucked the peasantry dry with every conceivable tax and regulation. Even in the poorest provinces in China, a warlord could make off like a bandit. So the peasantry, which back then was something like 
nine out of ten people walking around all the provinces of China, they bore the brunt of the worst of these famous excesses of these Dujin, or provincial military governors, who called their own shots and weren't beholden to anyone in Beijing or Guangzhou to prop them up. When Mao said in 1927 and 1938, Qiang Gan Zi Li Mian Chu Zheng Quan, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun, he yeah, must have been thinking about these warlords. And all these smaller, petty, opportunistic militarists throughout the provinces, these mini warlords, well, they would swear allegiance to someone who swore allegiance to someone else and all the way up to the top of the pyramid to a particular provincial warlord serving as the military governor. The buck stopped with him as far as military and civil administration in the province. The top warlords commanded a big army with lots of firepower, and it was personally commanded by him. But it was the fealty from all these much smaller armies down at the grassroots level. You know, that's how these major warlords controlled the province. And many, if not most, of these petty minor warlords, they were nothing more than bandits, opportunists, and predators of the worst kind. And all throughout this warlord period, loyalty was not an everlasting commodity. These generals and all their officers, down to the foot soldier, switched sides and betrayed each other for you know, whatever the uptick was in the market price for their loyalty. So the lines were always being redrawn according to the shifting allegiances among the various cliques. And Wang Chanyuan, he sort of led the pack. He was one of the first out of the starting gate, you might say, who took advantage of the situation, Yuan Shikai's demise. And all these Beiyang generals, well, they would either throw their lot in with Duan Qi Rei, or they might choose Feng Guazhang. Wang Chanyuan went with the Zhirli clique, which meant he took his marching orders from Feng Guazhang. Wang Chanyuan and many others like him during the second half of 1916, they were now spreading their wings and sharpening their claws as they began establishing personal control of their respective provinces. And no more was there one single strongman like Yuan Shikai to inhibit them or boss them around. From 1915 to 1921, Wang Chanyuan was in charge of all Hubei and ran it like a textbook warlord. He came down hard on his enemies and rivals, and despite all the initial violence, his early years were marked with general support from the masses and political leaders who appreciated the relative peace and order he had brought to Hubei. His soldiers were disciplined and he didn't carry out the kinds of violent acts that made these warlord soldiers so hated and despised. Chaos turned to order down in Hubei. As long as order was present throughout Hubei, Wang Chanyuan remained firmly in charge. To preserve order, it meant maintaining control over the troops under his command. He had already turned this second division of the Beiyang army that Yuan Shikai had given him command of, into his personal army. All warlords did this. This became their core army, and they just built on top of that. In the beginning, Wang Chanyuan concerned himself only with military matters. But in the wake of the anti-monarchical war, a.k.a. the Second Revolution, he expanded his control over civil affairs as well. As soon as he felt in control of things in Hubei, any loyalty Wang Chanyuan felt for his one-time benefactor, Yuan Shikai, evaporated. And Wang Chanyuan, he wasn't the only one. I'm just using him as an example. Other warlords used the chaos that ensued during and after the anti-monarchical war to spread their tentacles throughout their respective provinces where Yuan had placed them. And through coercion and appointing officers and officials loyal to them, they assumed control over civil administration. Wang Chanyuan, again, he was a nice textbook case of what I'm trying to present. 
every province during the warlord era has their own history that sort of went this way. With no opposition or viable opponents to stop him, Wang Zhanyuan farmed every nickel he could harvest from Hubei province. In his day, he was one of the richest men in China. He truly was one of the most predatory of all warlords. One of the extreme cases that gave these militarists their well-deserved bad reputation. During the years he controlled Hubei, he never missed an opportunity to maximize the amount of revenue that he could deposit into his personal bank account. Besides the political and military events that were unfolding, Wang Chanyuan's undoing was his rapacious greed and the loss of popularity that happened with his own troops. From the most powerful warlord down to the basest soldier, everyone had their price. And time and again, when one got cheap with their subordinates, immediately one's loyalties were put up for sale. And this is what Wang Zhanyuan did. He got cheap with his troops, withheld pay, often for months. He cheated on wages, and in an act that's all too familiar in today's business world, to cut costs, he tried to replace the older and more experienced soldiers with newer recruits who were willing to accept lower pay. Well, this finally led to a series of mutinies in Hubei that led to violent civil disorder that led to loss of faith in Wang as someone who could maintain order. And this ultimately led to Wang Zhanyuan's undoing. That, and of course, other warlord actions, such as printing too much money with denominations that ran in the millions, never a good sign of a stable economy. He wasn't the last warlord to wear out a few printing presses. It got so bad with Wang Zhanyuan in control that some officials in Wuhan were begging the foreigners to come in and establish control. There were two particularly violent and bloody mutinies by Wang's troops in the major cities of Yichang on June 4, 1921, and Wuchang four days later. And these soldiers blew off a lot of steam about all the back pay that hadn't been paid, and of course the attempt to marginalize all the over-40 soldiers in favor of younger, cheaper recruits. This created havoc and terror on the streets of those two cities, and they got wrecked. By August 1921, Wang Chanyuan's 15 minutes were up, so to speak, and after he was toppled, he fled Hubei to Tianjin, where he lived until 1934, dying at the age of 74. By taking this little detour down to Hubei province and zeroing in on Wang Zhanyuan, we can see that familiar pattern, how all this happened. Men like Wang Zhanyuan didn't just appear out of nowhere. I've tried to show, in part one, how the seed from which figures like Wang Zhanyuan sprang forth was planted during the Taiping Rebellion and with the regional private armies who acted as the government's surrogates to quash national disturbances. In a desperate attempt to carry out a great leap forward in China's military, academies such as those in Tianjin and Baoding were being established that served as the incubators of future warlords and their associates. And we'll see moving forward. Wang Chanyuan's story gets repeated all over China, in every province. Wang's story covered about six years, 1915 to 1921. Lots going on all over China. May 4th movement and the founding of the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. Let me just say, the warlords didn't like them. Communist Party members, organizers, and outspoken supporters were always dodging the warlords. And the warlords, as you might guess, also weren't too keen on the ideals of the May 4th movement, especially the ones about getting rid of the warlords. Let's go back and talk about the setup for one of the main headlining events of the early warlord era. This was the Jirli Anhui War. It was only a matter of time before these Militarists all started turning on each other. Summer of 1917, there had been a 
big confrontation down in Hunan. This province, next door to Hubei, had declared independence, and Duan Qi Rui was itching to take his army down there and bang some heads. He needed Hunan on his side, rather than having the Hunan army lean towards Sun Yat-sen. But Feng Guozhang was staying Duan's hand and saying, don't start a war. Let's negotiate a settlement with respect to Hunan and this whole constitutional protection war. The two most powerful forces in China, Duan Qi Rui and Feng Guozhang, had been at loggerheads over every single hot-button issue since Yuan's death. But with regard to the situation down in the key province of Hunan, matters finally came to a head. Duan viewed Hunan as his shortcut into the neighboring rival provinces of Guangdong and Guangxi. When Hunan trended towards the Beiyang government, things were fine. But by declaring independence they became a serious impediment to Duan's unification plans in China, with him on top. Duan Qi Rui pushed Feng aside and indicated he wasn't in a negotiating mood, and he sent his Anhui forces down south to drag the Hunan government back into the Beiyang fold. In short, Duan's army was soundly defeated by the combined forces from Yunnan, Guangxi, and Hunan. By November 1917, Duan Qirei's armies, after a poor showing, had to throw in the towel. And following this defeat on the battlefield, the beleaguered Duan Qirei had to resign as premier. For now, the fighting ceased. But the problems remained. In the meantime, over in Russia, the Bolshevik Revolution happened. This is going to have a rather profound impact on China in the years to come. As 1918 dawned, the Feng Guozhang allies Wu Peifu and Cao Kun led Zhirli clique forces down to Hunan and defeated the army down there. That was in April 1918. This was followed by a negotiated, peaceful settlement with Guangdong and Guangxi representatives spearheaded by Wu Peifu. The situation wasn't resolved, but things quieted down on the fields of battle. Feng Guozhang, leader of the Zhirli clique, he began to have health issues around the time his five-year term as president ended in 1918. And by the end of 1919, he passed away, handing the reins of power to the Beiyang stalwart and loyal Zhirli clique general Cao Kun. The presidency of the republic was passed to a longtime Yuan Shikai comrade, Xu Shichang. They were of the same generation, and Xu was a few years Yuan's senior. He was a nice, compromised candidate, not military, Beiyang friendly, but allied to neither the Anhui nor the Zhirli clique. Those of you who remember the Peter O'Toole character in The Last Emperor, it was Xu Shichang who had been the Chinese leader who arranged for Reginald Johnston to tutor the former emperor, Pu Yi. Anyway, he was on duty as president of the Republic of China from October 10, 1918 to June 2, 1922. That means he was president during the events that led up to, during, and after May 4th. That epical movement in modern Chinese history in 1919. Let me just prime the pump for part five in this series by introducing a couple names I've just mentioned. Two biggies, Cao Kun and Wu Pei Fu. Some names in this warlord saga are bigger than others. So as we proceed up and down the timeline, I'm going to occasionally pull off to the shoulder and briefly introduce the backgrounds of the more important figures and where they fit into our story. And these two... They were pretty big. Cao Kun, the one who picked up where Feng Guozhang left off as head of the Zhirli clique, he was just a few years younger than Yuan Shikai, and they had risen together in the Beiyang organization. Cao came from near Tianjin, Zhirli country. He came from nothing, and in an oft-repeated story I'm sure you're going to get tired of hearing, 
he rose up through the ranks of the Beiyang army, eventually commanding his own division. So he was a very high-up general in the Beiyang military. Bad blood existed between Cao Kun and Duan Qi Rei. This went back to Duan's role in thwarting Cao Kun's aspirations to the vice presidency of the republic. The political wing of the Anhui clique was known as the Anfu Club. They bought their way into the National Assembly and did Duan Qi Rei's bidding in political and government affairs. There are a number of battles and political maneuverings that Cao Kun was involved in, but in popular Chinese history, he's best remembered as the guy who brazenly bribed his way to the presidency of the republic. Cao was a politician at heart, even though fate made him a warlord. While he dabbled in the politics of the northern Chinese government, the official one recognized by the foreign powers, he left all the military heavy lifting to his number two, Wu Peifu. Cao Kun, if you could say nothing else about him, really wanted to be president of China. So he used his warlord wealth and influence and bought his way into that top spot. The popular anecdote that has been passed down since the moment it happened was that supposedly he was handing out 5,000 silver dollars to any national assemblyman who would give him his vote. It was done out in the open. No attempt was made to try and hide it. And when he became the sixth president in 1923, 1924, everyone knew how he got there. And despite the corruptible times they lived in, everyone around him sort of held their nose and shunned Cao Kun. By the start of the 1920s, the warlords were already acquiring a very smelly and odious reputation amongst the people, and certainly amongst the intelligentsia who couldn't write enough bad things about Cao. And the ill will didn't stop at Cao Kun. By extension, the entire Beiyang military organization, because of Cao's blatant corruption, took a hit to their share price. That's all in the future, however. We're still in 1919. Cao's closest comrade in the Jirli clique of the Beiyang organization, as I said, was Wu Peifu. He was one of the major stars of the Warlord Saga, a very influential and historic figure. Made the cover of Time magazine in September 1924. Now, I'm not going to say he didn't play a role in keeping China weak and divided in his capacity as a militarist, but he's generally regarded as one of the more acceptable faces of warlordism. Wu Peifu was very educated, born in Penglai, Shandong province, same hometown as Qi Ji Guang, who we featured not too long ago in CHP 230. He passed all the imperial exams and was a very cultured and educated guy. But despite all that background and education, Wu Peifu turned his back on the civil bureaucracy, and elected instead to enter the military. And if I told you he graduated from the Baoding Military Academy and later served in Yuan Shikai's new army, I suppose you'd have no reason not to believe me. So he had his own command in the Beiyang Army, and like everyone in that organization, he too took sides. He went with Team Zhirli. Though he came from Shandong, Wu Peifu's power base was in Henan, central China, in the ancient eastern capital of Luoyang. Not exactly Zhirli country, but he had taken Feng Guozhang's side when the Beiyang clique began to splinter. Cao Kun assumed the place of leadership in the Zhirli clique, and Cao had Wu Peifu and one other warlord we will get to next episode, Sun Chuanfang, these two as his right and left hands. And as we close out this part four episode, we see a civil war quietly percolating within the northern Beiyang clique. Cao Kun and Wu Peifu, in their determination to bring down Duan Qi Rei and expose him as a traitor to China and a stooge of Japan, went to great lengths to publicly smear Duan in the press and in various other circles of power and influence. So as the battle lines were being drawn between Duan Qi Rei's Anhui clique and Cao Kun's Zhirli clique, 
both sides got ready for the inevitable showdown. This is what we'll look at next time. The Jirli Anhui War. You won't want to miss that. Next episode, I promise you, we'll finally get to the old marshal. The Manchurian warlord, Zhang Zolin. He's going to get a little spooked at Duan Qi Rei's actions and will line up behind Cao Kun and Wu Pei Fu in the upcoming war. Again, I invite you to go to patreon.com and support the CHP and my Herculean efforts to put this stuff out there. Please consider doing that. You all remember perhaps old CHP episode 159, Chinese American stars and entertainers of old Hollywood? A lot of the info from that episode came from the direction of Mr. Arthur Dong. His Deep Focus Productions puts out a lot of this material about this subject. Well, he has a new book out called Hollywood Chinese, the Chinese in American Feature Films. If I may quote, it presents a lavish, highly illustrated look at Asian Americans in Hollywood films, beginning with some of the earliest movies shot in America's Chinatowns, followed by a deep dive into Chinese representation and misrepresentation in Hollywood's golden era, and ending with the remarkable Chinese and Chinese-American actors, directors, and screenwriters, remaking the contemporary cinematic landscape. Hollywood Chinese, the Chinese and American feature films, Arthur Dong. Look for a link to the book in the show notes. Thank you, everyone, if you made it this far. This is still Laszlo Montgomery signing off from the city that made Southern California famous, Los Angeles, the Big Orange. Thanks, everyone, who expressed their concern about all the California wildfires. I could smell them, but I can't see them. I'm safe for now. Okay, that's all for now. Do consider joining me again next time for another hearty and filling episode of the China History Podcast.